some of Ron Paul's seemingly grandiose but actually quite achievable campaign promises have included being able to reduce the income tax rate to 0%, to make gasoline cost one dime a gallon, and to reduce the size of the Federal Register or law books of the U.S. Federal Government, all within his first year in the office of President. Again, these claims may sound fantastical and bizarre to someone conditioned to believe we need to pay taxes, that gas prices will always inflate, and that the government will always write more and more draconian laws incrementally encroaching into our every last personal private space. Nevertheless, they are possible, at least at this point in time, if Ron Paul wins the Republican nomination in the general election for President of the USA. Points of Contention Ron Paul's liberty message could not be more opposite from the outlines for a new world order expressed in the protocols of the learned elders of Zion. The handbook adhered to, whether admittedly or knowingly or in secret or unawares, by all the new world order globalist rich elites today. Ron Paul's appreciation of Zionism as the movement for an Israeli state in Palestine is vastly knowledgeable and based entirely on factual historical events. The Protocols, on the other hand, were falsely attributed to the early Zionist movement by anti-Jewish proto-Bolsheviks in Russia while it was still czarist. The authentic origins of the Protocols are not yet now known and the identity of their original author remains a secret known to, if any, only a very small number of people alive on this planet at this time right now. On the other hand, the sources for Ron Paul's ideological beliefs are public figures, well known and for the most part well received the world over, including the framers or founding fathers of the U.S. Constitution, including Jefferson, Franklin, and Washington, and the founders of the free market and Austrian schools of economics, namely Adam Smith and later Hayek, von Mises, etc. While the protocols outline a methodology of hoarding gold in banks to gradually remove it from currency circulation, Ron Paul, the framers of our nation, Adam Smith, and other free market capitalists have all advocated to limit the size of private corporations by circulating the maximum amount of gold and silver as coin currency possible. In short, the New World Order's protocols dating back to no sooner than the turn of the 20th century, the earliest years of the 1900s, are actually a younger, retrogressive movement against the older, more libertarian movement toward personal liberty as an inalienable human right established during the later years of the 18th century, the mid-1700s. The difference between a globalist one-man dictatorship outlined in the Protocols and the U.S. Democratic Republic form of government laid out in the Declaration of Independence, Constitution of the USA, and the Bill of Rights and Additional Amendments is the difference between the New World Order on the one hand and Ron Paul on the other. If you believe a global empire under a single person hegemon is preferable to the current condition of the U.S. formed as a union of states under a single federal level of government, as far as I am concerned, you should shoot yourself now before a more liberty-minded patriot has to do it for you. For the most part, the minds of most real people are already made up and they're unanimously dead set against any further extension of the powers of the U.S. federal government. The TSA and DHS, along with all the other offices established or granted additional authority by the USA Patriot Act, should be repealed. Obama should be tried for the war crime of drone bombing unarmed and unaware innocent civilians in Pakistan, no less so than should George W. Bush be tried for his crimes against humanity in Afghanistan and Iraq, as well as at other black sites used in his extraordinary rendition program for torturing detainee POWs in the invasions of those sovereign nations.
Ron Paul is pretty much 100% the ideological opposite of George W. Bush in every way that Barack Obama is the physical opposite of W. Jr. Points of direct contention. The question is occasionally begged in the MSM regarding their non-issue of Ron Paul's electability if he has ever gotten any bills passed. The pundits are quick to agree with one another that it would be worth finding out, but they never follow up on it. In truth, Ron Paul was the original author of what became the later imbalanced and ultimately top-heavily draconian anti-Wall Street high-risk lending regulations of the Dodd-Frank bill. When Ron Paul wrote the original framework for this legislation, it was simply not called Dodd-Frank. It was called Audit the Fed, and under the final passage of Dodd-Frank, a partial audit of the Federal Reserve was conducted by the GAO on top of the regular annual in-house inventories supposedly conducted by the Fed within its own vaults, or rather its own accounting ledgers. The lending practices revealed by this partial audit provided better insight into the high-risk international bank loans the Federal Reserve was also issuing out simultaneously to its redistributing the federal government's income from taxes into the big bank bailout of 2009, to its remaining FDIC member-insured banking subsidiaries. As it turned out in later subcommittee hearings held by Ron Paul as a member of the Congressional House of Representatives, the Federal Reserve lent out over one billion U.S. dollars to European central banks in Greece, Germany, France, Spain, and the Swiss Netherlands to sustain the controlled collapse of the euro which has begun in Greece with the massively unpopular cuts to their retirement austerity programs as a means of paying down the Greek national debt to the U.S. Federal Reserve Bank. Of course, no one dares mention such things as debt forgiveness or reneging on payment, and instead the finer options of complex wholesale laws wrought on the vine, while only the larger, much uglier options such as national bankruptcy or alternatively a run on the banks are seen and considered by the elders of the New World Order planning bodies and steering committees. If, for example, it were assumed that multinational organizations like the UN, the EU, and NATO, NGOs like the IMF and World Bank, as well as national government administrations under any form of political party, Democrat, or Socialist, or Republican, or Fascist, etc., ought to all be working together for the mutual benefit of them all, rather than of only one of them at the expense of all the others. They should not be competing with one another's populations over who controls whose natural resources. That's simply foolish, and the entire military-industrial complex is founded on that simple premise. If you see war for what it is, the ecosystem's self-digestion like a giant hungry stomach, then you should seek to find a way to feed this emptiness rather than simply just attack it. War eats soldiers and, like a flickering candle snuffed out in a sudden gust of wind, blinks their hopeful lives out of existence in the bat of an eyelash. War is the insatiable inversion of equally limitlessly lush natural abundance. When there is a surplus of resources for all to share, there is no competition over them leading to war. To break the stranglehold of armchair industrialists and energy barons over the R&D testing done for and with the U.S. DOD's deployed military forces, Ron Paul intends to simply override any naysaying by generals embedded in hot zones about leaving, and to, on day one, bring all the troops home. Ron Paul will end the constant conflict begun by Karl Rove, but the dates back to even prior to Nixon's administration, with the declaration of U.S. troop commitment to the Korean national conflict under U.N. resolution. 
points of potential further contention. The obvious point is differing with the New World Order on the issue of the use of war, which Ron Paul believes should only ever be constitutional meaning declared by the Congress, never by the executive branch. Unlike Hillary Clinton, for example, Ron Paul is not an international affairs bully, itching to start a fight with any Mideast nation and to extradite Julian Assange of WikiLeaks and to charge him with a thought crime as an enemy of the state in the U.S. Ron Paul is for allowing Iran to continue developing its nuclear power plant program as well as for allowing Israel to bomb Iran's nuclear waste storage facilities as potentially weaponizable levels of uranium enrichment, all without U.S. involvement at all in the affairs of either nation. And when it comes to Julian Assange, Ron Paul stands beside both the right of Assange to publish the material once leaked and of the Internet to freely redistribute it. The other obvious point of difference between Ron Paul and the New World Order is Paul's repeated attacks on the Federal Reserve Bank, not only on its myopically limited methodology of inflation of sector bubbles by keeping interest rates artificially low, but against the entire premise of the need for it to exist, being an investment and loans rather than commodities and savings bank. The institution of the Fed itself is to be blunt, how the rich elites fund their black budget R&D by laundering the government funds collected by the IRS from the U.S. citizens as taxes, which in turn is how the rich elite continue to leech their imaginary authority off the individual citizens of the USA. The issue of whether taxation is necessary under a U.S. federal level government that has been scaled down to solely offices justifiable by the original constitution of the USA is a good debate, or would be if the average US citizen assumed taxation weren't mandatory as they do, but optional as it in fact is. However, besides attacking the rich elite's pro-war ideology as well as threatening to cut off their funding at its source by petitioning the audit with the ultimate intention to end the Fed, there are further points of contention between Ron Paul and the New World Order. Libertarianism, if indeed Ron Paul's philosophy, when taken to its ultimate extent, advocates the same goal in the end as Marxist socialist communism, that is, an anarchist utopia. Now, free market capitalism and a revolutionary multinational dictatorship by the proletariat might disagree about which road to take to get there, but they agree their destination is the same place. Thus, ultimately, Ron Paul's ideals are, in their peak, alike those of Barack Obama, a socialist, and Mitt Romney, a corporatist, and they all believe they are doing their personal best to achieve the same end, an anarchist utopia. Results of Contentions Thus far, the New World Order has succeeded in introducing spin onto every direct attack by Ron Paul. The 2008 election cycle came down to him running out of money. The Audit the Fed bill evolved into Dodd-Frank and yielded only a partial, though nonetheless shocking, audit. The 2012 presidential campaign is currently in an upheaval following mass arrests made at multiple state convention levels caucuses that had turned into what could only be described as Ron Paul rallies, with so many supporters showing up that it caused the conventions to be shut down. Followed immediately in the MSM by Rand Paul, Ron's son, the Republican senator from Kentucky, announcing that Ron Paul was conceding the nomination and that Rand was now supporting Mitt Romney for the Republican presidential candidate. There has been little or no word from Ron Paul nor his immediate campaign staff on these issues in the last few days since this all occurred. Gerald Salente, the trends predictor I mentioned briefly earlier, was interviewed by AM and Web InfoWars host Alex Jones on these matters, and Salente replied in brief that Obama would win if put head-to-head -head against Romney, but that he hoped Rand Paul's endorsement does not mean that Ron Paul is completely out of the race. In truth, there has been a barrage of behind-the-scenes action on behalf of the Ron Paul campaign staff